Welcome to the UP Notable Books Club, brought to you by the Upper Peninsula Publisher and Authors Association. Phil Belfi is the editor and publisher of the Zibby Press, enrolled member of the White Earth Band of Minnesota Chippewa, co-director of the Center for the Study of Indigenous Border Issues, and Professor Emeritus of American Indian Studies, Michigan State University. He has been involved in environmental issues at the tribal, international, national, state, and local levels for over 45 years. He is also a lay advocate, qualified and admitted to practice tribal law in the courts of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Belfi is also the author of Indians and Other Misnomers, a cross-reference dictionary of the people, persons, and places of Native North America, Three Fires Unity, the Anishinaabeg of the Lake Huron Borderlands, and the editor of Honor the Earth, Indigenous Response to Environmental Degradation in the Great Lakes, second edition. I'd like to introduce you also a two-time UP Notable Book Award winner, Phil Belfi. It is good to have you back. And uh, thanks for coming tonight. And we are excited to hear about what you have to say on your little book. Okay, uh, first thing I wanna do is I wanna say hello to my cousin. I'm not sure he's still there. Uh, Greg Schneider, if he's still there, there he is, okay. There he he's is. He's part of my maternal side and also the California side of things. So happy to see you, Greg. Uh, Evelyn, you mentioned the fact that this book is short, and it is short, it's only 70 pages. But there's a little bit of a, a backstory on that. If you've read the book, you'll understand it was my master's thesis. Huh? And I was the kind of person that I wanted to get in there and get out of there and get it done. And I didn't want to spend my life as a student, although being a student is a wonderful thing. So I had a, it was a, probably a, more than half again as long. So I took it to my major professor, sociology department down at Michigan State, and he looked it over and he put a lot of notes in there saying, well, why did you talk about this? Well, what, what's Pontiac kind of doing about this? So every time he objected, I just took it out. And then I resubmitted it. And he said, well, you didn't, you didn't attend to any of the things I suggested. I said, Rick, I want to get this thing done. I took out all your objections. I met all your objections. So here it is. You know, it was much shorter. And he reluctantly agreed that that was okay. And so I think he wanted to get rid of me as much as I wanted to get, get the thing done. Uh, I was getting, getting my degree under the GI Bill and they only had so many quarters they were gonna pay for. So <laughs> I wanted to get it done as soon as I could. As I say, it was my master's thesis, and I had lived in Detroit when I got out of the military for a year or so. I went to Oakland University that year, and then I decided to move up north. And I had some land over in Sioux, Ontario at the time. And I thought, well, I'll just move up there. I can take my GI Bill to Lake State. It was like Superior State College at the time. So here I am, I'm a, I wasn't a res person, I was a native person living in the suburbs of Detroit. And I moved up to the Sioux and it was in a completely different, it was culture shock to be sure. Because here I'm a long haired bearded person like I am today. And that was 50 years ago. And I was stopped by the police for driving too slow on the freeway. <laughs> if you can believe that, because I had my truck all loaded up with stuff. But anyway, I was struck by the, the very different uh, situation between Sioux, Ontario and Sioux, St. Marie, Michigan. And the college is up on top of the, the bluff. And so from the college, you can see Sioux, Ontario. You can see Sioux, Michigan, too, of course. And it was a, a daily reminder, if you will, of the difference between those two cities that are separated by the, the rapids there. So I started uh, thinking about that particular dichotomy, even when I was an undergraduate at Lake State. So when I went down to get my, my master's degree, this is because the, the VA had extended the 
the GI Bill to allow that to happen because I couldn't afford to pay for myself. The first class I had down there at Michigan State was called uh, His Documentary and Historical Research Methods. And I said, oh, that should be interesting. I'm going to take this class. I'm going to research my, my, district, my thesis. So that's what I did. I had an idea about what I wanted to do. Chippewa County, Sault Ste. Marie, the UP, that kind of thing, resource extraction. So my very first master's thesis, graduate school course, I did all my research. I had everything done. And uh, this book evolved from that process, of course. Uh, also, I should probably say that this is my revised, I shouldn't say revised, I didn't revise my thesis, I added to it. I had a new introduction and a new conclusion and put a bunch of pictures in there to make it look nice. Because in uh, 2018 was the 350th anniversary of the founding of the Sioux and I thought it would be a good time to revisit that old, that old thesis that I did. So I resisted changing anything on my thesis itself other than a few typos. I think there's still one in there, but uh, is that you, Greg? Yeah. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Likewise. Uh, so anyway, the, the, the volume that you have, if you can see it, I don't know if you can see it there. But anyway, Right here on the cover, there's a little symbol. You really can't see it very well, but there's a symbol there. This, this is an excerpt from a map that was done by Henry Rowe Schoolcraft. He was the Indian agent, and this map was created in 1837. And he put these little symbols on here and there. It's like a, an ax and a shovel crossed where there might be minerals. That's why I decided to put that on the cover because it showed, at least in his mind in 1837, that there was minerals to be had in the Sault Ste. Marie area. The map was created before the 1842 land session, which included all of those areas of the iron, ore, and copper. So that's, the map doesn't show those areas. But anyway, he was misinformed. There was some mining going on uh, it was more or less on the northeast shore of Lake Superior, quite a ways from the Sault Ste. Marie area. And it was very controversial because that land had never been ceded. And so the, the First Nations people were very, very upset that there were people up there mining. And so they led a raid. It was called Micah Bay, M-I-C-A Bay. And the, the chief of that First Nation of that area was Shingwak was his name. And the RCMP, it wouldn't have been the RCMP because they weren't around with that. Anyway, the authorities came and arrested him and took him to jail in Toronto, which was you know, really quite the, quite the incident, if you will. And because of that raid that the native people did on that mining area, and because of the fact that Shingwak was arrested, they finally decided to negotiate a treaty. So that's where the Huron-Robinson 1850 treaty came about. So uh, all of this stuff that I just mentioned about the Mica Bay and all that is, was post my thesis. And if I had to redo the whole thing, which I'm not going to, but if I had to, I would include a lot of discussion about the native aspects of this particular resource exploitation. So uh, I could mention a couple of things which are kind of of interest perhaps. In 1826 there was a treaty between the Winnebago and uh, what we would call the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Ottawa, etc. people. And there was a, a conflict because the land had not been ceded. This was 1826. And there were miners going into the area. And I don't know if it was copper miners or iron ore, but the point is that there were miners coming into the territory that was not yet ceded. So the government 
negotiated a treaty. It was essentially a peace treaty, which said that if there are any miners who come into the territory that has not yet been ceded, don't molest them. <laughs> Call the government and the government will remove them from your territory. So some people have taken that 1826 treaty as a, an agreement between the government and the native people to allow the miners to go in there and mine. And it was exactly the opposite, of course. No, we're not going to have miners come into our territory. It's ours. We have not uh, engaged in any treaty making to cede that territory. So, but people do point to that 1826 treaty as some sort of uh, agreement between the government to allow mining and it's just, it's simply not true. And from what I've been reading, most of the mining problems that have been occurring, like whoever it is out there in Montana, that led to certain uh, issues that the government uh, looked into, looked after, but most of it had nothing to do with any lands east of the Mississippi. It was mostly the Western areas where all that, those mining resources were available. So the academic world has come up with this theory, if you will, that when we signed treaties, they were settlement treaties. We agreed to allow the colonists to settle our territories. We never agreed to give up our rights to the minerals and the water and the other resources, you know, uh, that, that I talk about in the, in the book. So uh, if I had to do it again, like I said, I would explore that whole aspect of that those resources were never ceded. They're still ours. And the fact that we lost billions and billions and billions of dollars with the resources out of the UP uh, without having ceded those resources by treaty, it's, it's still very controversial even to this day. So again, if I had to do the book over again and do the research again, I would include a lot of those types of issues. Okay. Uh, does anybody have questions or something you need clarified or whatever? Okay, we've got one question, go ahead. Well, he mentioned out here in Montana, I didn't know which one he was referring to, but right just south of where we live is the um, flat or the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Reservation. And there's been ongoing back and forth for years about water rights and who has the water rights. Yeah. And of course, farmers say one thing, the, the natives say another and uh, yeah, it's not over yet. <laughs> no, not by a long shot. And I know the water rights is a really, really huge issue, especially now that we're in these drought areas. And, you know, here in the, yeah, we're in the Great Lakes, obviously. And we're turning the place into a desert. You know, we got drought problems here in the Great Lake, in the Great Lakes, even though Lake Superior is a little bit higher than usual. But the point is, that, yes, there's water, Water is the, uh, the conflict of the future. It's very, very serious, obviously. Really obvious and out with west. With all the drought, we got a lot of wildfires. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, out really west. Really obvious out west. But, yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah, here in the Great Lakes, we're... Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh this is Sharon. Um, I didn't get a chance to read your book, but when I was looking at it on Amazon, I read those first couple of uh, paragraphs. And first of all, it was nice to read something academic. I hadn't read anything academic in years. Okay, so just that the first little blurb was great. But you mentioned when you moved up here, you saw the dichotomy between Sioux, Ontario and Sioux, Michigan. And I was wondering if you, uh, do you mention that in your book as to why that happened, why they got the industries and, and we didn't? Uh, yes. And again, it's, I suppose in the academic world, these theses are supposed to be somewhat controversial by their nature. And my argument is, still is, that the industries 
in Sioux, Ontario were actually integrated into the local community. And they had a steel mill over there, they had a paper mill over there. The steel mill is still there, it's undergoing um, upgrades and now they're not gonna make steel, they're gonna melt steel, they're gonna you know, go to scrap metal and whatever. But the point is, and the paper mills just shut down a little bit and all that is in the book. But at the time that there was, all of this was being developed, the resources were available and whoever was in charge of all that stuff over there decided to build a steel mill right there. Here, we took the steel out of the upper Great Lakes, Minnesota and the UP and shipped it down to Cleveland and other places. So those places got the resources, they got the, uh, the jobs and et cetera, et cetera. And what we got is my professor down at MSU, I won't say the word that she used, but she said, if somebody was asking her, well, what are we gonna get for development? And this guy was from Jamaica. And she said, you're gonna get nothing but a big effing hole in the ground. <laughs> and that's what we have here in the UP. We have a lot of, a lot of abandoned mines and they just shut down one of the, recently shut down one of the two existing iron mines. And uh, I think they're doing a little bit of copper mining again, but most, almost all of those mines are closed too. So yes, yeah, so we just got big holes in the ground. And places like Sioux, Ontario did have their, they still have their steel mill and they still have a bit of prosperity that comes along with that. I thought so that's uh, the difference between the two. I, I thought uh, in your research, um, I thought that Sioux, Michigan did have the opportunity to have the plant over on this side. Did, did you come across anything like that? Or was that just hearsay that I heard through? I mean, I'm from Brimley. I live in Brimley. So, you know, I'm 10 miles away from you. So it might just have been folklore yeah, it, that I heard. Well, I, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was one guy in particular who was trying to develop the entire area. And he had ideas for both sides. And I think there was some talk about putting the steel mill on this side of the river, but for whatever reason, I don't know what happened. What they did try to do, and it ended up being the, the power canal, they tried to take the Lake Superior height and the lower lake height and create a whole series of sawmills and other types of mills that would be powered by water and create a big industrial complex there, which anybody knows is through that area is now the golf course. It was just too, too low and too wet. They couldn't actually develop it the way they wanted to. So what they did is they ended up doing that power canal, which became the Union Carbide plant mm -hmm. at one time. And that's, that's really the focus of the book. It talks about all the industrial areas of the Sioux. We didn't have a steel mill, but we had a, the world's largest tannery. We had that, the uh, Cadillac Sioux Lumber Company, which was huge. Union Carbide was huge. There were several big industries. And you know there was a bit of prosperity at the time, but most of those places shut down by, I think about, 1975 when the air base closed all the industries had been already closed down and it, things just went downhill from there so the peak was probably the 1970 census as far as population in the area and then it just well it's never recovered you know, no we've never returned to that type of prosperity no that's for sure what yeah. about the first nations on, on the Canadian side, um, did, the, did the, the, what? Did the natives, the First Nations, the Indian tribes in oh, Canada, yeah. did they have a problem with their resources being stolen? Or do you not cover that in your book? Uh, well, it's very interesting you should mention that because there's two First Nations across the river there. One's called Batchewan and the other one's Garden River. And they're actually, the reserves are adjacent to each other. But the Batuana people are, and I, I don't think I'm saying this in a derogatory sense, they're very militant people. They're very sovereignty minded. And I don't remember the year, but there was a point in time that they issued what they call a notice of assertions. 
and what it was, and they had it published in the Toronto paper, in the Montreal paper, etc. If anybody out there in Canada land or anywhere in the world wants to come into our territory to develop our resources, you come to talk to us. We don't care if you talk to the, to the Ministry of Natural Resources or the Crown, but we don't care what they think. You come talk to us. And so they do have a mining development up in the up in the Wawa area. And they negotiated with the mining company and they got exactly what they wanted. I don't know what they did because I wasn't part of their discussions nor have I seen their contract, but the mining company said, okay, we'll come and talk to you and you know, we'll pay attention to your concerns and the mining company's working right now. And they did the same thing with somebody who wanted to put in some wind generators on a near Montreal River because the Montreal River has been dammed up and they do some hydro there. But it's right there on the shore of Lake Superior. So they negotiated. In fact, I don't know if they own the entire company or they own part of it, but Batchawana is, is very much involved in all of that stuff. And one other thing they did and I'm not sure they ever really resolved this issue. It's been going on for decades, but they decided that they would uh, get into the, the sawmill business. So they told the DNR that they're or the MNR, they're out there and they cut some of their trees on their territory, considered to be crown land. And so they did, and they were arrested for the destruction of crown property that is cutting down the trees. <laughs> And so the argument in court was, uh, you claim that you own those trees, so show us the deed. And last I heard, uh, they had no deed, and they decided to go to the court. This is after, I think it's been about close to 20 years now, that they asked the court to dismiss the case because they don't have any right to, the crown, that is, has no right to those trees. Mm -hmm. And the First Nations of Atchewana people said, absolutely not. We are not going to have this case dismissed. We want to hear it to the end because those are our trees and we're going to cut them and make lumber and sell it. And that's the end of that. So, like I said, it's still ongoing. You know, it's been, like I said, probably close to 20 years now. So, yes, the, the Canadian First Nations people have a very different relationship than we do here in the U.S. They have actual constitutional rights that they have to be consulted, and the terminology is meaningfully consulted, and get their permission to do any sort of development on their lands in their historical territory. So we don't have that right here in the US. Mm. It'd be nice to have it, but no, we don't. Yeah. Thank you. So does that answer your question there? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I should mention, perhaps as part of my my concern with the both sides of the border, there's a little thing on the back. I don't know if you can see it there. It's a little logo, CSIBI. That's the Center for the Study of Indigenous Border Issues. And uh, it's a group of academics, of course. And because of my interest and in connection to all the both sides of the river, I was on what they call the Anishinaabeg Joint Commission, which was the two tribes on the US side and the two First Nations on the Canadian side. And we met quite regularly and were involved in huge numbers of issues that dealing with border stuff. So I, I know an awful lot about the, the border issues and the First Nations people. I wanted to give you a compliment, Phil, because I thought I liked this book. Um, I think I agree with Sharon. I mean, it was academic and that's nice. I was an English teacher for 24 years. So believe me, I've read a lot of thesis papers that never, I feel, get proven <laughs> where I think yours really does. And, you know, I, I grew up in the UP. I'm from the UP. I worked at the, um, I worked at the Empire Mine as a summer student, you know, for years while I was going to college. So I liked all that aspect of it. And then I think on the other side too, as far as colonization goes, quite a bit of my career, I was teaching overseas. And primarily I taught um, a couple of times, well, I taught in Africa, I taught in the Congo, which was 
quite the colony. <laughs> and also I married my husband's from Kenya, which was definitely colonized by the British. So I just felt it was, it was good. Well done. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I really thought that it, to me, it, well, yes, I never thought of it as a colony. So your, your book kind of made me really think, but I think that's definitely the right word. And I was just curious, did other people agree with me? Did you other, other people have the same kind of like, wow, that's true. What he wrote. I haven't read it yet, but I can tell. Well, let me, let me just add <laughs> this thing. Uh, my other book that won the UP Notable Book Award was my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And I led off that discussion by saying how happy I was that the uh, UPAA was willing to look at academic stuff. Because mm -hmm. that's what I do. And I'm very happy that I you know, was given the, the honor of having both of these books selected. And it, it is a very different perspective, obviously. I mean, I like poetry. I write some poems myself. I, I like fiction. I like reading it. I might even be writing some someday. But, you know, it's not often that you get the academic view of things. So I'm happy that we had the opportunity to sit here today and talk about things that are academic. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple questions. Hey, John, go ahead. Okay, thanks so much. I'm, I'm here in North Carolina, but I'm wearing my Copper Harbor shirt. To, to, <laughs> All know. right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm new to the, uh, uh, is it pronounced Upper? Well, I say you, Hello, but Victor. I'll take, I'll take Upper as well. <laughs> I, I want to get it right. Um, God, God willing, we'll be headed up that way uh, to see some family in about a week and a half. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed your book, Doctor. Is it Belfi? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Dr. Belfi, a couple of things. First of all, the academic component, I liked how, and, and maybe I, I read too much into it, but you're talking, I think you have to write the third person. You said that there was this effort to uh, bring this, um, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, so I, I don't want to get too deep, but you mentioned there was an effort to do something in UP, and then somebody started notifying others and the next day there was quite a bit of people that signed on and it, it grew from there and the event didn't happen it, 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 and I took that to mean that you were the one who had started uh just kind of letting people know hey this is happening I don't think it should happen well I don't know if it's in that in the book very much or not but I've been involved in environmental issues for 50 years now and our first foray into that was the uh i don't know people don't understand it perhaps because it's old but back in the days when we were trying to build a nuclear power plant on every piece of water they could find there was the clamshell alliance and various alliances and so we formed the great lakes alliance here in the, in the great lakes area and i was part of the group that led the campaign to keep the up nuke free and we won <laughs> yeah yeah still nuke free. So I'm from Midland. Oh, yeah. We were down there at that rally. Yep. Mary Sinclair. Yep. I, I was in high school. Ed Bradley was there. To, I, I saw him in the cafeteria or one of the local restaurants when he was filming for 60 minutes about what was going on. But, um, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, a couple of questions regarding uh, some of the information. Um my wife, uh, I've learned, uh, her family's from the Ishpeming area, and uh, her ancestry, uh, I think, is Ash Ashinanabi. Am I saying that correctly? Anishinaabe. Anishinaabe. Yeah, Anishinaabe. Yeah, Anishinaabe. So um, yeah. kind of learning more about that culture. I'm writing a book. I'm researching a, a a, a, a fictional uh, book, a novel set in the UP in 1987. And part of what I'm trying to do is tie in. I've been reading different histories about the UP and that. And, and, and I'm interested if somebody's writing, like I think uh, Victor mentioned there, one of the books, there was somebody who had done uh, some work and included uh, First Nation references and so forth. Is there a group of people that an author could go to to get feedback or information to say hey is this is this right is this representing the the culture right is it is it appropriate 
Do you have any guidance for that? Uh, send me whatever you got, John. I was hoping you'd say that. That's actually that. why I'm on this call. But thank you. That yeah. I didn't want to be too direct. <laughs> um, uh, the other, the other, yes, I've, uh, I've done that for great numbers of people. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Very generous of your time. Thank you. Um, as far as the book, two other questions. When you revisited it in 2018, uh, I noticed you were talking about the the percentage of um, the the resources that were going out of the area. And, and, and there was, um, I just wondered if, if you kind of kept your finger on the pulse over the last four years or if there, anything's changed since then dramatically one way or the other in terms of resource retention or, or drainage. Well, there are a number of uh, mining operations that have been at least talked about doing the back 40 and I see Horst is on here and he can answer a lot of those questions too. Uh, they were thinking about putting a hexavalent chromium plant across the river in the Sioux Ontario side oh. and that First Nations people are really really opposed to it so I'm not sure if that'll ever happen. I'm hoping that it won't yeah. especially after we had that hexavalent chromium problem downstate. Uh, yeah, just right here in Ann Arbor. We could draw it into the river system there. Wow. Yeah, Victor, you probably, it's in your area there, right? Heading towards me. But anyway, uh, there's really not been much. The only thing that, the, the, the big thing here in the Sault Ste. Marie area now, of course, is the creation of this new lock. There's a lot of activity going on. And I don't know, other than the fact that the gravel truck people are moving a lot of gravel these days. I don't know if there's really that many local jobs that are involved. So, you know, we have, well, I mean, other than the fact that the, the workers will come into the restaurants and they'll go into the grocery stores and whatever, but that's a short-term thing. You know, when they're, when the lock is done, whenever that might be 10, 15, 20 years from now or whatever, it'll be the same boom bus kind of thing. Okay. And it should also be mentioned that there used to be a lot of people who worked at the locks and they keep cutting back and cutting back and cutting back and cutting back. So even that is not going to, you know, it's not going to give us any, any kind of uh, prosperity or recovery. I it, guess, oh, go ahead. I was say, isn't it true, unlike, say, the Panama Canal, I mean, not a dollar is charged to any traffic coming up and down. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. Yep, I mean, it's free. It's, when we talk about corporate welfare. This is one of the biggest corporate welfare boons around for the lake carriers. It's at least a thousand. We do get a few salt through <laughs> in the Panama Canal. <laughs> they get it for free. Yeah, yeah it, it's free here. And there's no. And you can take your kayak through there, your canoe, or anything you want. Yep, no charge. And there's no. And the same thing as on the Canadian side. Oh, I just wanted to what? say too that there's no security either. They they check the uh, people as they go through the the, the locks, you know. To uh, if well, if you want to go to the park, they check your security. But there's no security check on all those ships that lock through from all all over the world. So I mean, we would be That's an easy true. target, you know, for a terrorist. Easy target. Not that that is anything. Well, it's funny you should mention that because my neighbor, he was here during the Second World War. Of course, I wasn't around during that time, but he's now dead. But his job was to sit up on top of the brewery. They had a, a brewery, it was the tallest building on the water at the time. And there was a machine gun nest up there. And that was his job to sit up there in that machine gun nest, make sure that no German planes came flying by to bomb up the lock. So. That was his yeah. experience for the Second World War. It was kind of an interesting. Plus, he got all the free beer that he wanted too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's considered a, a security risk because of all the, the iron ore that goes through. Yeah. Well, it was interesting because back in '76, Michigan State did an archaeology project at the old Fort Brady down near the locks, yep. and as part of that. Fort Repentier, the French fort that was there beforehand, we did some excavations on parts of that. 
And as we went through the stockade, we found several sandbag rings that had been placed on that boundary that were uh, anti-aircraft gun emplacements for World War II. They were there, they oh, yeah. were a fair amount, but most remnants are gone. Yeah. Yeah, they had Fort Lucas, I think, was established just for that purpose for the Second World War. Because Fort Brady had been turned into a college by that time. Or it was no longer a fort. Well, it, uh, yeah. You might know better, Gary. The college started mid-40s, but uh, Camp Lucas was uh, set up as a hospital area and then converted to they had barrage balloons, again, anti-aircraft there during the Korean conflict, and then that was it. Yeah. Hey, Phil. Hey. I got a couple questions. Yes, sure. So I don't know a lot about the UBI. I'll admit that I'm from when I was born in Detroit, but never really got up that way. But I was curious when you were saying that the industry has been <clears throat> vacating and that the base was sort of a driver for that. I was curious, two questions. One is the, the industry and the, the mining and things like that that are going on up there. Um, can you roughly, can you just sort of, you know, generally say what the impact of that was on the environment? And then secondly, if, if it was the base that was causing the evacuation, what brought them up there in the first place? The industries. Uh, I didn't get that second part, Greg. Uh, this, so About I was the, saying the if, the, if the Air Force Base, when it when it closed, that it caused the um, these industries to vacate the area. I was wondering what brought them there to do their their industry to do their uh, you know uh, mining and so on. What brought them there in the first place? Well, that was back in the, a long, long, long time ago when they first came because of the resources. If you look at the resources like the copper and the iron ore is the reason that the, the North won the Civil War because that's where all of the resources came from. They didn't have that kind of thing in the South, but they did have it in the North. So the copper clad, the monitor and the Merrimack, you know, and all that kind of stuff, it was very, very important resource base. Again, I'd call it a colony. As far as the air base, it was a, a SAC-based strategic air command. Yeah, I was in SAC, actually. And B-52s <laughs> out of there. Yeah. And uh, that was very environmentally damaging. I'm sure there's all kinds of PFAS and whatever else. But what they did is they'd send those B-52s out over Lake Superior for their training missions. And they didn't want to land with any fuel on board. So they would oh, just dump it, it in the lake. Yeah, they would just dump it in the lake and then, then they do their their landing, et cetera. They didn't want to land with a full plane, full load of fuel. But uh, when they closed, and I can't remember the exact year, it might've been about 72 or so, it really, really devastated the economy. I mean, it was already hurting because of all the industries had been closed in the late 50s and 60s. But when that came around, that was that was the death knell for the area. It wasn't in well, the was, uh, area is 20 miles south, but the point is that it was really, really devastating. So I was in SAC till 75 and I knew, I had a good friend that I went through officer training with that was stationed up there. And so it must've been late seventies when it happened. Cause I know I talked to him after I even got out in 75. So, but so, so what did the demand for those resources just go down? Um, uh, no, the resources themselves went down. Oh, like the Cadillac <laughs> Sioux Lumber Company shut down because there wasn't no more trees to cut down. Ah, okay. And, well, they still have a couple <laughs> iron ore mines. Like I said, there's one of them that's still operating. But when you look over to Minnesota, the big iron range over there, you know, there's a huge amount of iron ore there. And it's fairly easily <sighs> accessible and loadable and all that kind of stuff. So there's, and Steel's just not being made so much anymore. You know, it's being made overseas and being imported and 
whatever. So the demand fell off and the copper was pretty much just run out. You know, they just, they just couldn't find any more copper. Uh, Although they, like I said, I think they have a few little mines that are trying to operate now. So but yeah, the resources were gone. It's the same thing like with the fur, the fur industry, which I didn't talk about at all in this book, but you know, when they trapped out all the furs, oh, that's the end of that. So we're left so with did some the, big the mining and holes saying, in the did, they, did they pollute the lakes up there? Or? Uh, the copper is really, really, really bad stuff. The mining of copper. There's a place called Lake Linden and they got all kinds of really horrible, nasty stuff in that lake. You know, frogs with two heads and it's, it's carcinogenic and it's really, really bad. Mm -hmm. That area is, well, at Butte, Montana, in the copper country, that. they have the highest <laughs> rates of cancer. They have the highest rates of cancer in, in the U.S. And it's because mm -hmm. of the copper. And I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't really know exactly what the connection is. But yes, it's horribly, horribly environmentally damaging. There's a great big, huge toxic lake where the Berkeley pit used to be, where they strip mined the last of the copper. And it's so toxic that a flight of geese came in, landed on it, and promptly all died. <laughs> yeah, I can believe it. Well, one of the things they did with Lake Linden, at least as far as I know, is that that was where they dumped all the tailings. Yes. And they'd smash up the, the rock and they'd dump all the tailings in the, in the lake. And at some point they decided, oh, I bet there's still a lot of copper in that lake. So they went back and reprocessed all that stuff to extract the copper and then dumped all the junk back in there, I guess. And Lake Linden is, quite frankly, is one of my favorite places. It's a really very pretty little place, but don't touch the water. Yeah, one of the things that happened there is the original copper mining was mostly um, pure copper that was mined, but in, embedded in conglomerates in the rock. It went through the stamp mills. That wasn't quite as bad as when they started reprocessing because once they did that, they started using chemical processes to get the copper out of the rock that was left. So uh, a lot of that is yeah. due to the reprocessing, but hard really to know this, this far away. Yeah, all, all we know is it's an environmental disaster. It's not waiting to happen, it has happened. And there's not much cleanup. In the Sioux, we had uh, the tannery that was, was at the time the world's largest tannery. And they used all kinds of really nasty chemicals there. And that is a super fun site. They claim that it's cleaned up, but they put a fence around it. But I think what happened is that they cleaned it up until the money ran out and then they just put a fence around and walked away. So it's still still an environmental disaster there at the tannery site for sure. I, I just wanted to mention to Evelyn's point about um, learning, you know, stuff that really, several things in the book really, uh, were new to me, but the, I, I had no idea that, that all the hides were being shipped out there. That was really interesting. I, it, 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 my wife and I were talking about that. So it was, it was because of the, the tannin or the bark that was from the certain trees around there. Is that right? The hemlocks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The hemlock trees. Yeah. All right. Thanks. And that's, that's why they put the tannery there because they had water, of course. And then they had a, what they considered to be an endless supply of, of uh, hemlock. And they would, what they did in the Chicago, uh, I guess they call them atois, the uh, slaughterhouses, they would put all the hides up on trains and bring them up, up to the Sioux. And it sounds, today it sounds like, how can that be economically feasible? But obviously in the day it worked. Have any other questions or comments out there? A lot of good discussion tonight about this book, but I mean, it's a, it's a good book. Like you say, it's a little controversial. It's uh, it's you know, 
I don't know. I think it's really true. I think we are a colony. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I got, wanted to talk a little bit about the Tilden mine, which I live about six miles from there um, in Ishpeming. Mm -hmm. One of the things that CCI um, had to do, and this goes back a while, is because there was a huge issue with um, tailings basins and the pollution, you know, the use of that water and the water literally turns like bright pink for a while. But CCI, I have to give them credit for the cleanup efforts that they have done um, in, in the last say 30 or so 40 years. Um, and one of them is the Greenwood Reservoir, which is a flooded area that comes off the Escanaba River. And it's a huge, um, it's a huge reservoir and it's wonderful for fishing now. And it was reclaimed, it's, it's clean, it's good water. Um, and then they also um, were using the Schweitzer Basin and same thing, um, people now fish there. And so it is one of the things that, you know, of mining companies that I think the people forced some of that. And I'm sure that that also has played a part in the whole Eagle Mine um, controversy when they were looking to put the Eagle Mine in Northern Marquette County. And, you know, a lot of conservation minded people um, just really fought and protested and, and you know, forced some of the um, decisions. It's one of the reasons that the trucks have to drive they have to go a long way to take the um, the ore from the Eagle Mine location all the way out to Humboldt to be processed. When they could have had a direct route, just kind of drop south, but it went through wetlands. And it, while they tried to force a road to go in there, there is a, a like a two track kind of road. They tried to put in a road um, that the trucks could be on and it still doesn't exist and it won't exist because enough people stood up and said, no, you can't do that. Um, so I have to say, like living near um, an iron mine hasn't been like the worst thing, but I think that it's because people really stood up for the environment. And I can't speak to the damage that was done before all that happened, because we all know that there's a lot of pollution from before say the 70s when 60s and 70s when people really got active with conservation um, but I found the book intriguing and just even the thinking about how I had not thought about how so much is ravaged from our area um, so it was really interesting to read that book from that perspective of how um, you know, the people took that money um, that they made, but that money didn't stay here for the most part. It went somewhere else. And um, so in that sense, it was really kind of interesting to read the book with that perspective in mind. And I appreciated that. So thank you very much for that. Okay. Well, thank you. I'd like to add a note to that because I've also lived in Michigan for 19 years near another SAC Air Force Base, Fort Smith. And uh, oh, so yeah. we saw some of those similar things, you know, with the pollution yeah. and stuff. But I think that now that I'm in Montana, I see that the states further east where there's more people and more population to support there's a little bit more proactiveness in that environmental thing. Um, you know, out here, we still have the illusion that we're all free agents, and <laughs> at least some people do, <laughs> yeah. and that we can do what we please because it's our land. And, uh, you know, we're still working on that. Well, I'm yeah, well, like surrounded I said, I've been involved in environmental <laughs> Yeah, at the local level, the state level, the national level, and international level for 50 years. It's, it's the main focus of my life, actually, is the environment. So, and I don't know if anybody else really needs to know or cares about this, but I'm very much involved with Line Five opposition. In fact, I just talked to a, earlier today. I talked to a lawyer that we're ginning up a lawsuit on the whole issue. So. From the native perspective, it's going to be very, very interesting. 
People. I'm really interested in that native perspective too, because we have seven Indian reservations in the state of Montana. And yeah. so it's, it's a very important thing. Yes. And the Blackfeet are related to us, by the way. <laughs> I was just going to say, Phil, that uh, folks who aren't really, they, some folks might not be familiar with Line 5. If you wanted to just give a two-minute blurb about that. Okay, yeah. Uh, Line 5 is owned by Enbridge. Enbridge is a Canadian pipeline company and it takes Canadian oil. It's not tar sands oil because they won't allow that, but it takes Canadian oil through the Upper Peninsula, across the Straits of Mackinac, and then downstate, and then it goes over to Sarnia, most of it. So it's Canadian oil going through Michigan and ending up in Canada refineries. And putting that pipeline in the Straits of Mackinac, if they were to do that today, they would never be allowed to do that. I mean, it's just the most ridiculous thing that ever happened. That was in 1953 when they put that thing in there. And they've had some problems with it. Not necessarily the Line 5 in the Straits have been leaking, but Line 5 has leaked thousands of times, millions of gallons. And it's an environmental disaster waiting to happen. And our big problem with it is that that's treaty waters. We fished there, etc. And we are not being represented by Enbridge or the state or by anybody as far as our treaty rights. Some of the tribes have been doing some things, but and I'm not giving anything away that I shouldn't be giving, but individual human beings have been shut out of that entire process. So we as individual human beings, individual Native Americans, are going to assert our rights. And that's about all I have to, I can say right now. Well, and just just real quick, now Brian Newland, he's a member of the Brimley tribe, Bay Mills tribe. And he, yes. he I yes. mean, he works for the Department of Indian Affairs in Washington. Are you in contact? He runs the Department of Indian Affairs, yes. Yeah, I mean, are you in contact uh, with him? I mean, is he, I, I tried to reach him here a few weeks ago uh, just via uh, an email and didn't receive a response. So I may have to go through the local, the local uh, people here, his family. You'll have to go through the local people because, uh, you know, I'm not privy to everything that's going on, but I've been talking to a lot of people about a lot of these issues. And if there is an issue that affects Brian's tribe, he cannot, he can't even look at a piece of paper that talks about it because that'd be a conflict of interest and Ambridge would just, you know, they'd go to court and they'd have him removed and they'd get every sure. case thrown out or whatever. So he will never respond. I'm not saying that he doesn't read anything, but he absolutely cannot say anything. Right. And I just wanted so to do a people, human interest story. I just wanted to do a human interest yeah. story for UP News, you know, about local boy making good. Well, yeah, he, he should be able to talk to you about that. Yeah. So he couldn't um, talk about any any issues that deal with the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, you Maybe know. Maybe in a general sense. But that's yeah, sense. yeah, he never, I'm sure that he never got the email, you know, just went to an aide and that was that, but it, it didn't have anything to do with politics. Yeah, well, I, I know one thing for certain. He's a very, very busy man. <laughs> yeah. very busy man. He's a good guy. He's a they're, good doing, guy. they're doing a lot on the, the boarding school stuff. So I uh -huh. think that's their major focus, both he and uh -huh. Deb Holland, Department of Interior. Uh -huh. So if they have a spare minute or two, that's what they're working on, which is obviously an extremely important issue. Right. I'm happy that they're doing it. Uh -huh. Hey, Phil, all I got to say is I, I have always been impressed with your dedication to your work, and I'm proud to be your cousin. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, I'm proud to have you as my cousin, too, Greg. Thanks. We've done good things together. Last question. Do you think that the, the First Nations in Canada are 
maybe treated somewhat better by the government than the native tribes in the United States? Uh, it would depend on how you describe treated better. <laughs> like I said Listens before, to... <laughs> they actually have uh, constitutional right. Their treaties are enshrined within their constitution. The Aboriginal people have rights. And we have to fight for every single one of them. And if we if we do win one of these fights, well, then tomorrow we have to start another one. It, that's one place where it's very different in Canada. The other point, point that is very, very different in Canada, here in the US, the uh, colonizing process resulted in lots of big reservations. They moved people from place to place. Obviously, the entire Southeast was moved to Oklahoma for the most part. But in Canada, they really didn't do that. They left people there. So like in, in Ontario itself, there's 110 First Nations reserves, 110. You know, so it's, they have a very different impact. There's not one electric line. There's not one road. There's not one railroad that does not go through a reserve or several reserves. In other words, everything in Canada all their infrastructure has to be, you know, the, the native people, the First Nations people have to at least leave it alone, if not approve it. And of course they did shut down some things. They shut down bridges, they shut down railroads. And uh, I won't go into a big long discussion about what we were thinking about doing here in the soup because they were thinking about bringing nuclear waste across the International Bridge and across the Mackinac Bridge. And both First Nations people and non-Native people on both sides of the river were just in rage over the whole thing. So I will say this, First Nations people came into me after our public meeting and said, Phil, don't worry about it. And I said, what do you mean don't worry about it? They said, we'll just blow up the bridge, <laughs> the Garden River, there's a bridge, a railroad bridge. We'll just blow up the bridge. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so they didn't, they never did bring that nuclear waste. Or what they did, it was kind of stupid. They loaded it up on helicopters and took it across the, the border, took it down to South Carolina that way, reprocessing. Stupid. But anyway, like I said, I'm involved in environmental stuff and First Nations and non First Nations and U.S. tribal stuff, etc. So it's like I said, it's I don't mind political fights. I kind of enjoy them, but I like to win one once in a while too. <laughs> well, is there any other comments or, or questions or anything from the crowd before we sign off for the evening? Okay, I should I should fix my computer so I can see everybody. I can't see. Everybody. I'm on the wrong view here, but um, I just I just want to say um, just from myself one thing. Um, wait, now I got. I'm t I'm touching things on this <laughs> computer here. Hold on, <laughs> hold on here. But Phil, I just wanted to tell you that I I think back. You were our second Zoom meeting we had where we talked about three fires unity. And, you know, you just said something that was so simple that I never forgot. And it was just how, you know, the Native American people in this country, it's a, it's a genocide. And I had never heard those, those two words put together, Native Americans and genocide. And ever since you said that, again, just like your book about UP and colony, it's like, to me, it's true. And um, I like that about this club. I like that about our book club. I think it's, it's great. We get a chance to meet and talk about things and it makes people think. And, and because of that, you know, this genocide that's been going on for a very, very long time, we don't have a lot of Native American voices. So it's, we're really blessed to have you, Phil. Oh, I say miigwech. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we really are. And I'm really glad that Victor, um, you know, uh, is agreed years ago to have this Zoom club and that all of you guys come along. And it's, it's just, it's wonderful. And, you know, you really do make us think. So I hope you are writing something new for us. Do you have anything new that you're writing? Oh, something's in the pipeline. <laughs> well, Victor will 
will tell you, we're working on another book right as we speak. <laughs> and I have another one beyond that that I'm working on too. Well, I... So, and both I'm of them are... Named. Yep, I love our UP yeah. authors. And I love that all that you give give back to, to us to learn mm -hmm. more about where we live. So based, thank based on this discussion, I'm going to recommend Honor the Earth, which is another Phil Belfi book, right cool. along this... Right, what we've been talking about for the last hour, honor the earth. Yes, honor the earth. Yes, one of my favorites, indeed. Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you. Anything else from anyone? All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. You've been watching the UP Notable Books Club, brought to you by the Upper Peninsula Publisher and Authors Association. To join or for more information, please visit us at www.upa.org or www.upnotable.com.